Danielle Dixie here. Today I want to talk to you about backpacking footwear and I'm not just talking about boots versus trail runners but also camp shoes, insoles, socks, gaiters, and more. When it comes to backpacking people get pretty excited about gear especially when it comes to tents and sleeping bags but they often don't put as much thought into their footwear which can lead to some problematic times on trail because your feet get you from point A to point B, so it's good to treat them well and keep them happy and healthy. The two types of footwear that you will usually see on trail are the traditional boots and trail runners. So first let's talk about hiking boots. When I first started my through hike of the Appalachian Trail, which also happened to be my first backpacking trip, I thought that I would want a traditional leather boot. So that's what I picked out and I started with because I knew boots would offer me stability, ankle support and protection from brush. Also, I was starting in the spring, but it was early spring, so I knew that I would have colder weather and a boot would help keep my feet warm. Boots are pretty durable compared to trail runners, and I knew that they would last me nearly twice as long as a pair of trail runners would, so I was hoping to save a little money along the way too. What I learned while backpacking in a traditional leather boot is that they take forever to dry if they get wet, which can be a pretty inviting environment for bacteria and fungus to form on your feet. Nobody wants trench foot while on the trail. And also they were kind of clunky and heavy and just weren't comfortable because generally boots need a break in period. And I had started wearing them a month or two before I started my through hike just in everyday life, but your feet do things on the trail that they don't do in everyday life and, and the boots were just not formed to my feet for backpacking. I've always heard that a pound of weight on your feet is equal to five pounds on your back and apparently the Army Research Institute did a study on this so if you're interested in reading that I'll put a link in the video description. After my first 40 mile stretch on the Appalachian Trail I not only had heard that was true but I felt and experienced that it was true and also from the high ankle on the boot from the ankle support that I thought I needed but I really didn't I ended up developing tendonitis in my right Achilles and I decided that it was time to transition to trail runners. Does this mean that boots are horrible and I'm saying that nobody should ever backpack in them and that you should avoid them? No, I'm not saying that at all because I do think that hiking boots certainly have their place. For example, in the first stretch of the Continental Divide Trail, Aaron, had he been wearing boots, might not have cut his ankle on a rock because the first couple stretches are kind of bushwhacky, you're in the desert in some rough terrain. He cut his ankle and later had some swelling issues in his leg that a nurse said might have been related to the cut because he kept opening it while he was walking with one of his shoes. He would hit that spot that he had cut and it just kind of kept being a persistent issue. Now, could he have bandaged it and potentially wore a higher sock to help protect it? Yes, but sometimes boys will be boys and he didn't fool with it. Now, had he had on a higher ankle boot to help protect his feet and more rough terrain and, and brushy areas, then he may not have ever had that issue. So rugged terrain is a good place for hiking boots. Also, if you're gonna be carrying a heavy load, say you're going out to a trail and doing some trail maintenance and you know you're gonna have a lot of equipment on your back to take out there, then that might be a place for a more stable footwear. Also, maybe you know that you do need that extra stability and ankle support, or maybe you're gonna be going somewhere completely off trail and not on a clear, well-beaten path. Those are all instances where boots might be more useful than trail runners. Or maybe you just prefer the feel of a boot. That is okay too. If you're in the market for hiking boots, you'll probably see two main options, either a leather boot or a synthetic boot. And they do have some mixtures and, and different types of leather. Some that you might see are full grain leather, split grain leather, and then nubuck leather. Some of these leathers might be a little more durable and water resistant than others, while on the other end of the spectrum, you'll have a softer leather that is more breathable. Regardless, leather boots are not going to be as breathable and probably not as comfortable as a synthetic boot. However, the synthetic boots are not going to last as long as the leather boots. On the synthetic side of things, you'll probably see boots made out of nylon and polyester. 
they'll be lighter and probably won't require a break-in period or at least not as much as the leather boots but again they might not be as durable or you know last you as long if you're going to go with a leather boot i highly recommend that if the boots get wet that you do not try to dry them by a fire or out in the sun i mean that seems like the common sense thing to do this is wet i want it to get dry but with leather heat or you know baking in the sun or by the fire can cause shrinkage and then you end up with a very tight uncomfortable boot if any of y'all have ever had work boots you may have experienced this before because i've done that where i used a set of boots they got wet and then i threw them up in the bed of my truck and they no longer fit as comfortably it's also a good idea to oil and treat the boot to keep it supple and not so hard and brittle with hiking boots you're going to have a wide variety of options you may see things like a low cut boot so a boot that looks more like a trail runner but it is still you know a more rigid shoe but it'll be low cut on the ankle then you'll also see mid cut boots that may offer more ankle support and then high cut boots which are going to be your most stable and sturdy and give the highest support and the highest cut of course would be for more off trail or dangerous type terrains while i have occasionally seen people out on trail backpacking in boots the most common type of footwear seen out on trail now is the trail runner and they're basically like a sneaker but with more aggressive tread and i think the reason that things have trended towards trail runners is because as backpacking gear is getting more lightweight and more compact the need for such a stable rigid shoe is just not really as necessary as it used to be some of the things that i love about trail runners is that they're lightweight they're breathable they dry much more quickly than a boot they're comfortable out of the box and they're versatile i'm much more likely to wear a trail runner in day-to-day -day life because they're comfortable like i would a tennis shoe than i am a more rigid leather hiking boot while i love trail runners they do have their limitations they're not going to be as supportive or as protective of your feet as a hiking boot will and they aren't gonna last as long because they're just not as durable. I tend to replace my trail runners at about 500 miles anyway. I have had some that wear out before that, but I've also had some that would last longer. It's just that I tend to develop plantar fasciitis and I feel like the support in a trail runner is gone after about 500 miles and my arch tends to hyperextend. If you're a boot wearer who has been considering switching to trail runners, there is a mid trail runner made by ultra so like a boot it comes up higher on the ankle and i know that there have been some people that were a little leery of switching and then they tried the mid and then they ended up going to the full-on short ankle trail runners so that's just something to consider if you're interested in trying out something different and i bring up ultra because ultra is the most popular brand of footwear on the trail right now almost everybody that i passed on the pacific crest trail and the continental divide trail while i was through hiking was wearing ultras by far the majority ultra was actually founded by two fellas that were trying to help runners solve some issues they were having with their feet they realized well running shoes generally have this little wedge in them that allow a drop from the heel to the toe but when we walk around barefooted we don't have that you know our toes are level with our heels so what if we just cut that wedge out and create a zero drop and see what happens and a lot of the runners who are having issues no longer had foot issues anymore another thing i love about ultras is they are known for a wide toe box and this allows your toes to spread out in the shoe where a lot of other shoes i feel like kind of cramp everything up around the toes and that can get real uncomfortable and cause more issues especially with blisters while you're backpacking now if you're used to wearing normal tennis shoes that have a drop from your heel to your toe then i would caution you to just be mindful that the zero drop shoe takes a little getting used to sometimes when your calf is used to being elevated and kind of more bunched up and then you suddenly drop it and it's stretching more it can cause a little discomfort so ultra suggests that if you're transitioning to a zero drop shoe that you do it gradually you could maybe wear the new shoes for a few hours a day or if you go on walks in the evening maybe start wearing it just for your walks but during the day continue with your normal footwear however you want to do it but it's just something to be mindful of i'm not saying that you will definitely have any kind of issue or discomfort because actually on the pacific crest trail in the middle of my through hike is when I made the transition from a Solomon shoe that had a drop in it to an ultra shoe with a zero drop. And 
Maybe it's because I was already sore from through hiking in general, but I didn't really notice any difference and it didn't cause me any issues. While I love Ultra, they are not the only brand of trail runners. So if you end up giving them a go and they don't work for you, that doesn't mean that all trail runners are terrible. Sometimes it takes trying a few different things to figure out what works for you. I just want to say a quick word on Gore-Tex. I'm not going to go into too much detail because I actually just did a video recently on this topic alone. So I will drop that link in the video description also of this video so that you can watch that if you're interested in learning more. But Gore-Tex is basically a technology that's designed to be breathable yet waterproof to keep your feet dry. However, Gore-Tex will also keep your feet warmer and stickier and can be a breeding ground for bacteria and fungus and it's just not as breathable as I think the idea of it was meant to be. Plus if you're going to be out in the rain for a while your feet are going to get wet so Gore-Tex just kind of inhibits that drying process and I think that Gore-Tex footwear has its place in winter hiking. This video is more about three season backpacking but in the warmer months I am personally not a fan but some people are again it's all about personal preference but if you're interested in learning more about that or waterproofing of footwear in general then check out that video next up let's talk about sandals and if y'all are thinking what <laughs> sandals for backpacking yes a friend of mine named south pole who i met on the appalachian trail hiked in sandals and at the time i met him he was going a little bit slower because he was actually suffering from a broken toe while sandals aren't going to be as protective of your feet obviously they do have their benefits for example if you're going to be going through an area that has a lot of water crossings then instead of having to either pull off your shoes and your socks and and forward and then put them back on or just go ahead and trudge through and get your shoes soaked and then have the chance of getting blisters or having other issues it's just really nice to go through with sandals that allow your feet to dry very quickly because there's a lot of breathability in those also if your feet tend to swell a lot it might be nice having that extra space for them to expand there are several brands of hiking sandals out there but two of the ones that i've seen on trail are bedrock sandals and chacos while shoes are certainly important and i think to have the best experience while backpacking at least for your feet to have the best experience it's good to get something like a trail runner or boot or sandal, whatever you prefer, something that's designed for being out on the trail. However, if tomorrow you had all of your gear to go on a backpacking trip and you realize, oh man, I don't have footwear specifically for the trail. All I have is a pair of sneakers and I spent all my money on the rest of my gear and I don't have $100 to go throw down on some new boots or trail runners then that's okay. I mean, certainly be more careful on slippery rocks and, and things like that where your tennis shoe may not have the tread that trail runners or boots will. Um, but if you've got a well-fitting sneaker that has some decent tread on it, then don't not go have fun and have an experience because you don't have the exact thing that you think that you need. So as long as you're, you know, basic needs are taken care of shelter food water uh, i'm not saying don't go just because you don't have one of these expensive types of footwear in fact my friend perk who i met on the appalachian trail started and completed most of his through hike of the at in a regular pair of new balance running shoes so just something to keep in mind and i think grandma gatewood through hiked in a pair of kids i think the most important thing is making sure that whatever you have on your feet is comfortable so with that, I want to talk about proper fitting footwear. There are two rules of thumb that I usually go by to make sure that whatever I have on my feet is going to properly fit my foot. And that is the thumb test, which is where I make sure that I have a thumb width between the tip of my toe and the end of the front of the shoe. And then also the toe tap test where I lace up my shoes like I normally would if I was going to go backpacking and then tap my toe on the floor. And if I feel my toes hitting the front of the shoe, it's a no-go, unless you want to lose some toenails. And ask me how I know, because my big two toenails turned black and fell off on the PCT because of that issue exactly. Of course, the best thing that you can do to ensure that your shoes are going to fit properly is to go into a store where there are professionals that can measure your foot with a Brannock device and help you select something. Not everybody lives near a place where that's possible, so there's always the option of ordering from Amazon so that you can get in the shoe, try it on, walk around your house with it, and you have 30 days to return it 
pretty much hassle-free from what I've experienced with Amazon. And then also you can order from REI. And with REI, you can keep something up to a year. And if it doesn't work out for you, then they allow you to return it. If you're a member, I think is the only requirement. Now that means that you could actually get a pair of footwear, try it on, you think it's gonna work, you get out on the trail and you hate it, then you can go ahead and return it. And the thing with REI is it doesn't just go into a landfill at that point. They generally take the more gently used items and then they'll do an REI garage sale. If you're not familiar with those, you should definitely check them out. You can get great gear at a discounted price. If you do end up in a situation where you're out on the trail and your feet start giving you some kind of problem because your shoes aren't necessarily fitting properly, there are some lacing diagrams that you can look at. So I'd either save it to your phone or print it out if you're going out for the first time and a new pair of footwear. And that way, if you're in a pinch, then some of those lacing techniques might help you out a little bit. But this is definitely a Band-Aid and not something that I would consider as a permanent fix. You want to get some kind of footwear that feels good when you have it on the way that it is and you're not having to do little fixes like that. Let's talk about insoles. The insoles that come factory in whatever footwear you get may be fine for your foot. For me, they were not. I found that I needed a little more support, so I went with Dr. Scholl's for plantar fasciitis. And unfortunately, that's not the first thing I tried. I actually went with the Sole brand of inserts first and I thought they were cool because you can put them in the oven and then put them down in your shoe and put your foot in there and they kind of mold to your foot. Another popular brand among backpackers is Superfeet and with Superfeet they have different styles for different types of feet but it's not a one size fits all so I can't tell you exactly what will work for your feet but if you are noticing a little discomfort then it may be something that can be solved with a different type of insole than what comes factory in your shoe. Also, the best option is to go to a podiatrist if you're having issues and get custom made orthotics, but it's kind of pricey and not something that everyone can afford to do. So there are other options that are gonna be cheaper. I think Superfeet and Soles run about $50 or so. And then the Dr. Scholl's for plantar fasciitis, if you have issues with plantar fasciitis, usually run about $20 and you can pick those up in a Walmart or sometimes at drug stores. Just a little tip that I wanna add that I found out about on the Pacific Crest Trail during my through hike out there is the wonderful invention of lock laces. They're basically just elastic laces that you thread through in place of your shoelaces. And then there's an adjustable plastic piece that slides on on the end. You can just tighten the little plastic piece if you want your laces tighter or loosen it if you want them more loose. And I think that they are wonderful because I'm sure that I've wasted hours of my life tying and even double knotting the laces on my shoes. I replace my lock laces every time I replace my trail runners. That way I don't have to worry about them dry riding and breaking or anything like that. And as long as I replace them each time, I haven't had any issues. The final type of shoe I wanna talk about today are camp shoes. A lot of folks when they go backpacking will take some sort of lightweight sandals or Crocs. That way when they get to camp, they can put a different type of footwear on and still have their feet protected around camp. But allow their feet to breathe and that is so important when you're on trail to take care of your feet and allow them that time to kind of air out. This will help with blisters and also preventing any type of trench foot or any kind of gross stuff going on with your feet and just to have a different type of footwear on feels very very nice after a long day of hiking. Camp shoes are also very useful to have not only on trail but in town. So if you're going on an extended trip where you're going to go into town for a resupply, then it's nice to have something different to walk around in, especially if your boots or trail runners got rained on in the previous stretch and they're kind of gross and wet and you don't want to keep walking around town in those so you can give them time to air out, then camp shoes slash town shoes are nice to have. On the Appalachian Trail, I carried a lightweight pair of Tevas but I was really looking for any way to shed some weight. So I decided to get rid of my camp shoes. Even though they're not a necessity, it is a nice luxury item to have. It just depends on personal preference and if it's worth the weight to you. An extremely lightweight, but kind of hiker engineered option that I saw people doing on the AT and PCT is they would take a factory insole that they would either get out of their own shoes or find in a hiker box somewhere and then they would take laces and poke holes on the insoles where they could kind of fashion a sandal type deal or some way to tie the insole to their foot and their leg. 
That way they kind of had makeshift sandals for around camp. Nothing fancy by any means, but it's more about functionality than fashion when you're on trail. Now let's talk about socks. First, let's go over some materials. It's definitely suggested that you avoid cotton because cotton absorbs moisture and it takes a while to dry and the saying goes on trail that cotton kills. And this doesn't mean that cotton's going to come up and strangle you in your sleep or anything like that. It's just that when a material holds moisture and stays wet, then there's a higher chance of hypothermia if temperatures drop. The most common type of material that you will see in socks on trail is merino wool. And this is a specialized wool from a New Zealand sheep that is just extremely soft. It's not your granddaddy's army blanket. It's also odor resistant and wool keeps its insulating properties even when it's wet. Synthetic socks are also common. You might see spandex, nylon, polypropylene, just basically as long as you're avoiding cotton, you're doing good. When you're selecting socks for backpacking or hiking, you wanna pay attention to the thickness of the sock. The thinnest type sock that you will see is actually a sock liner, and these are designed to go up under your sock. It's real thin material that just helps wick moisture away from your foot. And then also it takes some of the friction between your regular sock and the sock liner. That way you don't have the friction of the regular sock on your foot directly. A common brand of sock liner is Injinji, and actually Injinji socks are pretty cool because it's like a glove for your foot. So it also protects in between your toes where people tend to be plagued with blisters. Just the way they walk, it seems that their toes rub together. And again, it helps take that friction and put it between the material instead of the skin between your toes. Injinji makes the sock liners and then they actually have socks that go up, you know, from thin, a regular sock to thicker socks. So from liners, the thickness obviously goes up. You'll have lightweight socks, midweight socks, and then heavy socks. Personally, I prefer the lightweight socks in the summertime. They just help keep my feet cool. I'll go with midweight socks sometimes in the summer, but especially in early spring and late fall, that way I have just a little bit of added warmth. But the heavyweight socks, the real thick, warm wool socks, I usually only use while I'm sleeping at night. I just don't like the bulkiness of them while I'm hiking. But again, with everything else, it's all about personal preference. In summer, I may use a mid-weight sock if I know that I'm gonna go through an area where my feet are kind of sore anyway, so real rocky terrain or something like that. When I get to the next town, I might reward my feet and add a little bit more comfort by going to a mid-weight sock. You'll also see a variety in length of socks, usually anything from an ankle sock all the way up to a regular crew cut longer sock. I personally prefer ankle socks in the summertime when it's warm. The only time that I found this to be problematic is if I'm in a real sandy area, so sometimes in the desert or especially in snowy areas. I know a lot of folks who have seen videos of me hiking in the snow are like, how are you wearing shorts and ankle socks in the snow? Isn't it cold out? Well, it might be in the middle of the summertime, but there still happens to be snow on the ground. But what I found in those areas is that either sand or snow might get trapped in around my ankle and it's real abrasive. So I've had my ankles bleed just from hiking in ankle socks in the snow. In those areas, I try to keep that in mind and move to a longer sock, whether that's mid ankle or you know regular crew cut. But for the most part in warmer temperatures, I do wear either a low cut ankle or a mid cut ankle sock. Then when it transitions to colder weather, I usually go with mid ankle, to a longer sock. I generally just mix it up, that way I have a variety and I can go with whatever I'm feeling that day. And I usually carry two pair to hike in and one pair to sleep in. When it's colder out and I don't really enjoy putting on cold wet socks on a chilly morning, then I might have three pair to hike in and one pair to sleep in. It's really not something to stress over. As long as you have a couple of pair with you, you'll figure out what your personal preferences are with the weight of the sock and the length of the sock, it just takes getting out there and giving it a shot. If you're wondering how I do a several day trek with only two pair of socks to hike in, what I do is I'll wear a pair of socks for a day or two, and then I'll rinse them out with some water and hang them on my pack to dry and then wear my second pair as the first pair is drying. And then if I need to, I'll take the second pair off, put the semi-clean pair back on 
and then rinse out the second pair of socks. But I just keep rotating them out like that. And I know that they're not as clean as if they came out of a washer and dryer, but as long as you're getting that salt and some of the debris off the socks, then it helps out with your feet a lot. I've tried several different brands of socks. I've used Ingenji's, Right Socks, Smart Wools, and Darn Tufts. My personal favorite are the Darn Tufts. I think that Smart Wools are a little bit softer and more comfortable than Darn Tuff socks, some of them. But Darn Tufts are the most durable sock that I have seen on trail by far. They've lasted me longer than any other brand and they have a lifetime guarantee. So while they cost sometimes $15 to $20 a pair, if you wear a hole in them, Darn Tuff will replace them without any questions asked. The last piece of footwear I'm gonna cover is gaiters. Gaiters are little sleeves that slide over your foot and up your leg and attach to the top of your shoes. You can get real tall waterproof gaiters, but most of the time for backpacking in three season weather, so spring, summer, and fall, most backpackers just use little soft, short gaiters to help keep debris and junk from getting in their shoes. So if you've ever had to stop and take off your shoes and knock some pebbles out of them or sand, then you might be interested in gaiters. Gaiters could have probably helped me with the situation that I was talking about with the sand and the snow. But myself personally, I just found that gaiters were kind of a hassle, just something else that I had to deal with. And I don't really have to dump out my shoes often enough that I felt like gaiters would be useful enough for me. But some people swear by them. They usually come with a little piece of Velcro that either sticks or glues to your shoe. But if you have ultras, they have a built-in gaiter trap on them. And then there's a little hook that attaches to the front part near the laces. And then the other part is just up fitted around your ankle. Some of the more popular brands that I've seen on trail are Dirty Girl Gators, which can actually be very colorful and interesting. And then Outdoor Research has some for those of you who don't want something quite as loud. Gators aren't a necessity, but they are something that many people have found useful. So I felt like it was worth mentioning in the topic of footwear. All right, y'all, well, that is all I have for you today on the topic of footwear. And if you have any questions about what I talked about, if I wasn't clear enough, please feel free to leave that in the comments below. Because again, I wanna help some of y'all who are just getting into backpacking and are like, what do I do with footwear? I don't know how to pick what I wanna wear. And for those folks who are watching today that do have a decent amount of backpacking experience, if you have finally found footwear, some kind of system that works for you, if you don't mind, please share that in the comments below because I'm hoping that some of the folks who are just getting into this can learn from some of the mistakes that us more experienced folks have made and things that we've learned about our feet and maybe you know when they're going through different trials and tribulations with footwear because I feel like nobody ever gets you know the perfect setup the first time so anyway thank y'all so much for watching and if you enjoy the content of this channel don't forget to subscribe and we will see y'all next time